antibiotics are critical for humans. For over eight decades, they have not only saved lives, but also helped transform them. From preventing premature deaths to successful cancer chemotherapy, it is difficult to imagine modern healthcare without them. But sadly, antibiotic resistance is growing. Worldwide, antibacterial treatment options are reducing, becoming expensive and less accessible. Known to be a silent pandemic, it can take the humanity back to the pre-antibiotic era when even a minor scratch or a common infection could kill. Hello, I am Amit Khurana. I lead the work of Sustainable Food Systems Program at the Center for Science and Environment. Penicillin, the first antibiotic was a chance discovery in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, a Scottish bacteriologist in London. It was only in 1941, with the help of pharmaceutical companies in the US, penicillin was mass produced to save countless lives of soldiers in World War II, hence known as a miracle drug. Then followed the golden era of 1950s and 60s, when many pharmaceutical companies became keen and developed antibiotics of several novel types and classes. But since 1980s, the antibiotic revolution had begun to fade. Antibiotics developed since then are not novel enough. They have less power to kill bacteria, which now have become smarter. All this while, the world desperately needed novel antibiotics, more so against the gram-negative bacteria that can cause severe infections like pneumonia and pose a big threat in hospitals and intensive care units. These gram-negative bacteria are a major part of WHO's list of priority pathogens against which existing antibiotics are becoming ineffective and new antibiotics must be developed. With only 77 antibacterial candidates in the clinical development, the global antibiotic pipeline is weak and minuscule compared to drugs that are in development for cancer and other chronic conditions. The clinical pipeline of traditional small molecule antibiotics to target priority pathogens is also stagnant since 2017. The short term scenario is bleak. Only nine such molecules are in phase three of clinical development and none are for tuberculosis which can cause deaths. The long term scenario also lacks promise. Only about 15% of the 217 candidates in preclinical development are near ready to enter into clinical trials. This is too less a pool considering a high risk of failure at this stage. To top it off, most antibiotic developers are small and medium scale companies which need support. Major pharmaceutical companies have left the space of antibiotic development. Some exited decades ago, others more recently. Our analysis of the clinical pipeline of 15 high earning pharmaceutical companies revealed that of the total 1007 candidates as on June 23, only 13 are antibacterials, which are developed by only four companies, eight by GlaxoSmithKline and remaining by Roche, Pfizer and AbbVie. Most companies are focusing on one or more of other disease areas. This big exodus is not only because of the high risk, low return of antibiotics, it is also because of humongous profits that drugs for other diseases can make. Collectively, the revenue of these 15 companies was about US dollar 711 billion in 2022 and a considerable 17.5% of which was invested in research and development. The often cited market failure is typical for antibiotics due to the phenomena of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotics have to be used less to remain effective. New antibiotics are to be kept as reserves and developers can't push them for sales. On the contrary, if a cancer drug is used more, it earns more profits as it continues to remain effective. Shorter duration of bacterial infections is also linked with lower sales volumes. Antibiotics are also kept inexpensive for them to be affordable and accessible. This means profits from selling antibiotics would not be enough. This also means that traditional market-based models will not work. Recovery of research and development costs will have to be delinked from the sales revenues. Mm. 
Reforms are needed to stimulate the antibiotic research and development ecosystem for sustainable as well as equitable antibiotic access. This includes greater public financing and right balance in public-private partnership. Perhaps new taxes on profits of pharmaceutical firms. There are two approaches talked about to support antibiotic research and development. One, push incentives which include grants and technical support for early and late stage research for primarily small and medium scale companies. They are working but considered insufficient. Then there are pull incentives which are being worked upon by a few high income countries to help a developed product enter into the market. These include the UK's piloted subscription model which is completely delinked and involves a fixed payment per drug per year to a company. That includes Sweden's pilot of a partially dealing reimbursement model to ensure access in hospitals. And then there is Pasture Act of the US which is yet to pass. It is clear that much more needs to be done to address the triple crisis. The crisis of antibiotics becoming ineffective, the development crisis and the access crisis. The global community needs to find a response that will meet the scale and urgency of this challenge. Perhaps it is time the development of novel antibiotics is considered a global public good. A new episode of Call for Action on the most pressing issues will be out every Friday. Press the bell icon for regular notifications. For further information on antibiotic resistance, please visit us at www.csindia.org. And for more engaging content on science and the environment, subscribe to the Down to Earth YouTube channel.